guys, welcome back to our restoration project. So in today's video, we're gonna go over the last of the important details we'll wanna consider before closing up our, uh, our early 2.0 engine case here. I was gonna do just one video where we put everything together, uh, install the crankshaft, intermediate shaft, oil pump, uh, 574, put it all together and uh, call it a day. But I really just think there's just so many things here to talk about, all the little details, all the little things you wonder about. Should I do this? Should I not do that? Uh, we're going to open up some of those things, look at them, and uh, see if we can't clear up some uh, some misconceptions about some of these things. So um, in today's video, we're just going to focus on our intermediate shaft. So we're also going to talk about assembly loops, um, what's a good one, what's not a good one. Uh, they're probably all good, but we'll take a look and see exactly what's happening with them uh, before we pull things together. You can see exactly uh, why we would want to use a thicker one versus a thinner one. Um, and then also today we're going to talk about connecting rod bolts, uh, torque values versus stretch, uh, high performance bolts versus uh, stock uh, Porsche connecting rod bolts. Uh, a lot of things there to really take into consideration, especially if you're building a stock engine. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with our intermediate shaft first and uh, take a look at that. And then we'll move on to our uh, assembly loop shootout. Okay, so let's take a look at our intermediate shaft first. So uh, I've got this all cleaned up. Um, I've oiled the bearing surfaces in here, and this particular case has not been milled out for uh, later bearings to be inserted. So we're just using the case as the bearing surface. Um, Ollie's checked it out, and it looked to be pretty good. Um, there is some backlash uh, to be considered in our intermediate shafts, and there is a way to measure that. So what do you do if your backlash seems to be excessive? Um, which is uh, too much wiggle between the, uh, the gear sets here or too tight where you're actually feeling some drag or some resistance in there. Um, the way Porsche set these guys up is they numbered them. Uh, there's a number inside the case which is back here. We'll take a look at that. Um, and there's also a number on the front of your intermediate shaft and there's a number on the front of our crank pulley there. Let's take a look at those. So our numbering system is designated as either a zero or a one. So we're a zero. And then you can see some etching on the face of this, uh, this gear on our crank here. So that's also a zero. So we have zero, zero on this particular set. Now this is the set that came out of the car. They were paired and uh, ran together. How many miles are on this set? I have no idea. Um, are they original? I don't know. Uh, do they have a lot of wear and tear on them? Um, as far as the teeth go, I mean, I can see where, where they've been run, but I don't really see anything um, that shows any damage or any excessive wear or any kind of stress. Um, on our intermediate uh, pinion there, you can see just a slight bit of pitting, um, running some dirty oil over time. But uh, I don't really see anything to be gained here by switching either one of those out. Let's take a look at the numbering on the inside of the case. Okay, so there's our number back in there. So this case is actually numbered a one. And then if we go to the uh, pages I've printed out of the manual here, on the left here, I've got a page out of the original manual uh, that talks about some things. And then a revised page, uh, and this was also uh, dated uh, 66. So this was the revision page and there's some uh, data on here we want to take a look at. So on the original page, this is right here, that um, as we come down near the bottom here, uh, the gears must be so mated that install tolerances are zero with a maximum clearance of one one hundredth of a millimeter. Now that's pretty darn tight. And taking a look at our revised page here, you could pause this and read it and uh, get what you need to get out of it. Um, but they talk about uh, whatever was talked about on this page is no longer relevant. This is the way they're doing it now. So uh, depending on your case numberings, um, this would be your crankcase number here. In our case, we're number one. Uh, crankshaft gear identifying number, we are a zero. And then uh, intermediate gear number, we're also a zero. And these would be the tolerances. However, in this particular setup up here where we have a zero in a zero, um, that's supposedly mated with a number zero identifying case. This one down here would be more applied to us than the one up there. Um, so these are supposedly the specs we're running between. However, um, I really don't have any noticeable click when I'm, when I'm pulling on the gears back and forth. 
I'm not hearing or feeling a click. I don't feel any resistance. Um, I don't really know where we can go from here because if we if we had a different intermediate shaft labeled a one or a crank gear labeled a one, we would be even tighter according to these specs uh, and the way I read it. So that being the case, you know, what do we do here? A lot of times when you're engine building, you kind of got to go with how things present themselves. Uh, what do you have to work with and what are your options? Um, at this point, I have no options really to change out any gears to improve our uh, lash here. So let's take one more look at that. All right, let's just set this back in here for a second. We'll take a look at something else. Okay, so we're setting where we should be setting. And when I'm running these gears together, um, although I don't feel a noticeable click, um, there is no resistance whatsoever that I can tell. And I have no lubrication on the gears, but I do have my bearings oiled. Um, there is no resistance here. These gears have been run. So in the case of this, I mean, we really don't have a whole lot of choice. We're just going to have to go with it. We do have an end plate that will have to be considered later, but for now we'll just worry about our uh, gear lash. Let's take a look and see exactly how much lash they're talking about. So this is the smallest shim that I could find I have in the shop here uh, that is within spec range. So this 0 0.038 millimeters uh, is right in the middle range of this guy. And how thick is that really? I mean, we are talking <laughs> that is thin. I mean, that's hardly anything. Um, and we can be even tighter in our lash. So I don't have anything this small, but uh, let's just say we go ahead and use that. What I've done... Just for uh, kind of an example here, I've cut a sliver off of this. We're going to stick it in between the gears. So I don't really see how uh, setting up a dial indicator is going to benefit us here. If I can't actually fill anything, um, we got really nothing we can measure. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to cut this sliver off here of our 0 0.38, which would be on the heavier side for us anyways. And we really need a thinner one uh, because we are tighter, but we just don't have anything in the shop. So I'm going to squeeze this into one of the uh, gear meshes there. I'm going to rotate and see if this thing comes to a stop. If it rotates through, then theoretically we should be okay. Let's take a look and see if that works. Okay, so I got my shim laying in there. You can see it just sitting right there. Let's go ahead and rotate that and see what it feels like. Okay, rolling it in. So it does pass through the gears, um, even though it feels a little bit snug. Um, if we had an 025, it'd probably be more right on the money for us. Um, but in this case, we really just don't have much choice. We're just going to have to go with it. So according to the revisions here, uh, what they're talking about is that they had made some kind of a case change or some kind of a change um, center to center from our crankshaft to our intermediate shaft centers. And this particular one here is 104 millimeters. Um, and they changed it to, from our case, which is a number one, 104.000, or on the small side, 103.990. We're probably in this range right here. That's why it fails a little bit on the snug side. Um, and then for the other case, which would be number to zero, you're actually smaller on, uh, on your measurement. So you're 103.990 to 103.975 on the small side. So some kind of a very small change they made between those on this particular case. Uh, that's what we're working with. So that's what's going on with our early case. We're, uh, we're right here and probably on the tighter side. And the last thing we'll want to consider with our intermediate shaft is uh, going down inside the shaft in here and getting that cleaned out before we seal our fade here. Um, so how we can get this guy out, it has a retaining clip. We want to pull that. You can pop this out by putting a rag over this end and uh, blowing compressed air into this end. That'll pop it out of there. Um, and then you just want to make sure it's all rinsed out. You don't have any debris inside. Uh, some brake cleaner in there, some compressed air. Do a real nice job. And then you can put that cap back into place. Okay, and then moving on to our assembly lube shootout here. So uh, why would we want to use an assembly lube in the first place? Um, okay, so if you're a novice engine builder, probably what's going to happen, um, you're going to be working on this part-time and uh, you're going to do some things, put it together, and then come back again to it at another date. Um, and it could take weeks, even months, to build an engine and complete it and get it running. Um, that being the case, um, if you were to assemble using a engine oil only, which is our example over here on the right. So this is a 2050 weight Motul. Um, this is a high zinc uh, mineral-based oil. 
Um, this is what I'm going to use to uh, break the engine in and run with it and also do some lubrication as we assemble. Um, and it's a really good lubricant, but you can see uh, what's happening here. And this is just after two days setting on the bearing there. I put an even coat on there. It's all just kind of puddled and ran off to the center as it drains. In the middle here, I'm using a Permatex Ultra Slick Assembly Lube. Um, a little bit stickier to the feel. I put just as much of a uh, thickness buildup on there, on that bearing, as I did with the engine oil. But you can see also, after two days, I mean, it's runoff and drainage is virtually the same. So um, maybe this has some advantages. Maybe it doesn't have some advantages. But by looking at this here, I'm not sure that I'd want to use it just because of the drainage issue if I'm a novice engine builder. Over here, um, I'm using a different uh, graphite moldy type combination. They're also using um, some different things in there as a carrier. And you can see it's a lot more sticky and gooey. Uh, on the left here, I'm just running the straight style lube engine assembly lube. In the middle here, I'm running the uh, same thing with the engine oil on top. And this is probably how I'm going to put this engine together. I prefer engine oil uh, to lubricate things and put together, but for me, I know that uh, by the time I get this engine put together and actually run in the car, the runoff or the drainage would be far too much for my situation. A professional engine builder, they probably roll through this thing one day, have it all put together, and in two days they'd have it in the car and running. In which case, uh, an engine oil would be a better deal. But for the novice guy, going to be sitting around for a while, an engine lube is really not a bad idea. Okay, and then last part for this video before we start assembling our engine, uh, let's talk about the connecting rod bolts and uh, what could possibly happen here doing a stock engine build. So these are our original um, connecting rods. This would be known as a I-beam configuration. They also make uh, aftermarket like an H-beam, much stronger chrome moly steel, forged steels, uh, they make titaniums, um, things that are much more tougher, tensile strength is much higher than something uh, like this one here. Um, what exactly this is made of, I have no idea. It looks to be some kind of a cast steel alloy blend um, just by appearance. Um, I wouldn't consider this to be an extremely high tensile strength, uh, an extremely durable connecting rod. Um, they have been checked out by Ollie's. We are okay to reuse them. Okay, so at Ollie's what they did there is they shaved the the surface and then they put them together um, and then they resized this area here at the big end. And so by doing so they, they torque it down, resize it, and they get a perfectly round shape uh, during that process and then we're able to reuse these. So one of the things that uh, there seems to be a lot of obsession over is the connecting rod bolts. I am replacing the originals with uh, new connecting rod bolts from Porsche. Um, they do not have a stretch torque specification with this and we're not going to worry about that because we're going to actually torque ours down to spec or the way it was done at the factory. Um, and the reason we want to do that is because we don't want to risk damaging the softer, less strong steel connecting rods. Okay, so the reason um, I'm going to torque these down versus go through all this stretch uh, detail, and I haven't used ARP bolts here. Um, although I have used ARP uh, connecting rod bolts in the past, I have them in my Tiger. I also have uh, Chrome Molly H-beam uh, connecting rods in there. But that's a whole different application. It's a very high output uh, engine, um, and it has different forces against it. These I-beam connecting rods are only so strong. So what could happen, let's just say you get a real uh, high tensile strength performance uh, connecting rod bolt. Um, that's all fine and well if you have the connecting rod that can take the pressure and the stress of torquing it down or stretching it to spec. So these connecting rods here, uh, spec on these is around 36 foot-pounds of torque uh, to the surface here. What would happen if we took it up to 50 or 60 or even more pounds to uh, stretch a bolt? We could actually damage our connecting rod. You could put stresses on here. You could end up with a crack in here. You could get a crack developed here over time. The other thing that can happen um, after you've resized is when you torque down to such a high spec, you could distort 
your big end, it could be out of round, and you wouldn't know that until the next time you took your engine apart. So it's something to consider there, guys, with these uh, connecting rods. A lot of obsession going on with the stretch values and everything, but if you're building a stock engine, 130 horsepower, I would recommend going with the standard Porsche connecting rod bolt just to be safe. Um, how we're going to put this together, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can just uh, oil it, torque it down, and, and you're good to go. Or in my case, I'm actually going to use some Loctite. I just sleep better at night with Loctite. And we'll get into that when we actually assemble our crankshaft and show you how to do that where you can be uh, safe with it and it won't loosen up on you. Right, so there you go. There's uh, my two cents worth on uh, connecting rod bolts and uh, connecting rods for whatever it's worth. On our next video, we're going to actually assemble our crankshaft, uh, torque everything down. We're going to go through our connecting rod bolts and Loctite them up and take them to torque spec. Show you how I'm going to do that. Um, we're going to put it in the case here. We're also going to put together our intermediate shaft with our oil pump and get this thing ready to close. Well, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.